So the topic of today is the brain stem and uh, mainly medulla oblongata and pons. Uh, but we are going to start with a repetition of the spinal cord, uh, major information which are necessary uh, for the brain stem. So in the spinal cord, we have the white matter at the periphery and the great matter uh, in the central area. And we have central canal as the part of the ventricular system of the central nervous system, yeah. And uh, in the structures, we have somatotopic arrangement that a specific uh, fibers from uh, different levels travel, travel in a specific parts of the tracts, as you can see on this section. Which tracts we are going to use now in the brainstem? So there are two major of them, and one is uh, the so-called spinobulbo-thalamo-cortical one, which terminates in the area of 312 of the cerebral cortex, yeah? And the function is proprioception, so the position of the limbs, the position of the muscles, and uh, fine touch, yeah? That's the main function. And it's located in the posterior funiculi. So that's why it's also called a uh, tract of the uh, posterior fascicle. And it will be called within the brainstem as a lemniscal system. And it's composed of gracile fascicle and cuneate fascicle. And we will need these terms in the brainstem as well. Yeah. So that's one tract. The other is spinothalamic and spinoreticular. But mainly the spinothalamic system, it's crossed at the level of spinal cord. Yeah. So it's running here and it's crossed. So it's decussated in here and it takes a fast or acute pain, warm, cold, and crude touch. Yeah? As for spinoreticular, which is traveling together, it takes slow pain and it's half crossed and half not. And then to supply cerebellum with all the information, so both proprioception and pain, yeah. We have special tracks which travel here in these areas, yeah, and we call them spinocerebellar. And they will divert in uh, brainstem into cerebellum. So these are ascending tracts. If you have questions, you can ask. And the descending tracts we divide into so called pyramidal, yeah, and the pyramidal is here, and it's crossed at the level of C1, yeah. So between medulla oblongata and spinal cord. So that's uh, mainly for voluntary uh, motorics of distal uh, muscles of the limbs, yeah? And then we have the other system. The other system contains all the other tracks. We call them extra pyramidal. So it's involuntary movements and they come from reticular formation so reticulospinal tract, and it's mainly for gamma neurons, but also for alpha neurons, yeah? Then from vestibular nuclei, vestibulospinal one, so it's for the postural muscles, that means mainly for the muscles which keeps you extended, yeah? That means standing, and if you are standing, majority of the muscles are extended, or of joints are extended, and then the rubrospinal, which terminates mainly at flexor muscles and uh, proximal muscles of the limbs, so the muscles of the girdles, yeah? So this is just to remind you uh, of the tracks we have talked about, and now we can continue into brain stem. So, what is, uh, you can, this is, sorry, this is a mistake. What is the main function of the brainstem? So, 
the same as spinal cord. It takes the ascending and descending tracks up and down. Yeah, that's one function. The other function is that it contains nuclei with alpha motor neurons. Yes, the motor nuclei, of course, somatomotor nuclei, but also the all the other nuclei, yeah, visceromotor and viscerosensory and somatosensory. All of them are located here. But for the spinal cord, these are for spinal nerves. Here they are for the cranial nerves. Why there is not number two and number one? Why there are not nuclei of these two? Can you give me the answer, please? Why the nucleus is not here? Nucleus. Yeah, they are not real nerves, perfect. They are just pouches, so they have, they have their centers, not nuclei, perfect. And what is specific to brain stem, even it's extended a bit into uh, cervical spinal cord, is so-called reticular formation. Reticular formation is a network of nuclei and their connections. That's why it's called reticular, like a web shaped structure and formation as it's a cluster of, of nuclei. Yeah? And its main function is to keep you alive. So it has a vital and autonomic functions. Yes, vital and autonomic functions. And for these functions, we have mainly uh, centers with reflexes, yeah, like breathing center, heart center, vasomotoric center, uh, it's also for uh, vigilance and arousal, so consciousness center, maturation center, sexual centers, and other ones. Yeah, we will talk about this at the end of the uh, brain stem. So uh, next lecture. So that's just the overview. If we look at the brain stem, it is composed of three main parts. Yeah, medulla oblongata, pons. It used to be called pons of Varolio. Yeah, but it is not used anymore because we have only one pons in the body and mesencephalon or midbrain. Yeah, between the brain stem and cerebellum, we find a cavity and the cavity is called fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle looks like as a as a tent, yeah, like a tent of uh, of a cirque, yeah. It's it looks like a tent, so that's so called fourth ventricle. That means we have a third ventricle in diencephalon, and first and second ventricle are not numbered because they are paired, so we call them just lateral ventricles. The ventricles contain cerebrospinal fluid, which is inside. Yes. Ah, the ventricle is in, in the extent of pons and medulla oblongata, yeah. but for midbrain, for mesencephalon, and if we have the spinal cord here, yeah, spinal cord, there is not an extension of the ventricular system, but there are narrow parts. In here, it's a blind central canal, yeah, canalis centralis, central canal. And in here, it's so-called uh, mesencephalic aqueduct, yeah? Aqueductus, mesencephaly, mesencephalic aqueduct, or sylvian duct, that's, that's used, yes, or sylvian canal. It's very much used in clinics, so please remember this term. So the fourth ventricle is only in this area. And the fourth ventricle is clinically very important as there are three openings. Yeah, one is dorsally and two are laterally. It's paired lateral and unpaired median opening. We will come to that again. And these serve for cerebrospinal fluid outflow into subarachnoidal space and then it's absorbed into 
uh, venous blood in suprasagittal sinus. So fourth ventricle is the only place where the cerebrospinal fluid can get out from the brain and spinal cord into subarachnoidal space. Yes. So if you look at the figures, we can see medulla oblongata, then pons, and mesencephalon is hidden here, just here. This, what you can see, is already part of diencephalon. Yeah? This is hypophysis, for example, and optic chiasm. Yeah? So this is diencephalon. Well, we have some other structures here. So we can see a decusation of pyramidal tract. We can see number one of cervical spinal nerves, yes. And at this level, we have also foramen magnum. So that's the level, uh, or that's the border between spinal cord and medulla oblongata, between spinal cord and brain stem, okay? Okay. No questions, it seems, so we can continue on the section. Yeah, here, nicely visible. Spinal cord, medulla oblongata, and you can see pons. What is in, in pons interesting? It's ventrally bulging, yeah? Ventrally bulging structure. Mesencephalon, on the contrary, is quite deep here. And that's why it, it is not much visible from the ventral aspect. On the contrary, dorsally, it's well visible, this, yeah. These, they are, call, call, they are called collicles, yeah, these bumps. And uh, medulla oblongata is a bit visible here, but pons not. Pons, pons is hidden and you can see it only if you take cerebellum out. So you will never do this during operation. So you will never see the dorsal aspect of pons. Yeah, it forms the floor of fourth ventricle together with medulla oblongata. And you can see the fourth ventricle here. This is the sylvian aqueduct, yeah, the sylvian canal. And this is already the third ventricle. And what you can see in a golden color, that's diencephalon. Here on this section, yeah, on this figure, you can see pons, yeah, and medulla oblongata is this one, and mesencephalon, mesencephalon is this one. And you can see nicely dorsally here the collicles, yeah, which forms the dorsal aspect. There are four of them to superior and to inferior. So this is mesencephalon. And medulla oblongata. This structure is called olive. And you may remember that the nerves emerge here. It's so-called retro-olivary and pre-olivary nerve, so a groove, sorry. Which nerves is this one? Which nerves appears in the retro-olivary Groove. Can you write me, please? Which nerves emerges from the brain stem, from the medulla oblongata in the retro olivary groove? Just give me the numbers. What is the right answer? After the cranial nerves, we have talked about that. Yes, Katarina, perfect. It's the mixed lateral system of the glossopharyngeal vagus and accessory. Yeah, and in pre-olivary groove, of course, is hypoglossal nerve. Yes. Okay, so let's start with medulla oblongata. There are some synonyms for medulla oblongata. Yeah, bulb, bulb of spinal cord. Yeah, bulb of spinal cord because it's enlarged, it is like that. So that's why we call it like a bulb. And then the pons is across. So you have an imagination that the spinal cord 
is enlarged and then it's terminated and it's covered by pons when looking from ventral. Yeah, that's why the medulla oblongata is also called bulb. Or a term myelencephalon, when myelos means medulla, uh, which means spinal cord, medulla spinalis. Yeah, so it, it is something like a spinal cord brain. There's a question, is the mesencephalon visible without removal of temporal lobe? Uh, of course, on the brain, if you take the brain out, you can see only this and very badly. If you remove cerebellum, you can see it from behind, yeah? But if you do not remove uh, the other hemisphere, it's, it's very hidden. So for operations, it's not easy to, to approach it. So what we can see on the ventral side, there are three structures. One is called pyramid in Latin pyramis, one is called olive in Latin oliva, and one is called trigeminal tubercle. Yeah? So on a figure pyramid, the pyramid looks more as a cylinder, yeah? A bulging, which is oval, but definitely not as a real uh, pyramid. And this is the decusation of pyramid. And the pyramid contains uh, corticospinal tract, yeah, which is the major descending voluntary motor tract. And in the decusation, the pyramid decusation, 80% of the fibers are crossed. So that's the pyramid, yeah. Then this is olive. And you can see the 12th nerve here and uh, the 9th, 10th and 11th cranial nerve here. Ah, uh, what is below olive? Olive on a transection of the brain, we will see it looks as a folded sec like this, yeah? And uh, inside the olive, if you, if you uh, make an histology, you find that there are more nuclei, yeah? There are more nuclei. So we call it inferior olivary complex, a complex of more nuclei. And as you can see, its main input is into cerebellum, yeah? So the olive is a nucleus, through which information goes into cerebellum. Okay, you can ask why we need olive. Because the information goes from spinal cord to cerebellum through the spinocerebellar tract. Yes, that's true. And some of them are relate or synapsed in olive. And olive gets information from above, from other structures which are above, like uh, red nucleus, uh, reticular formation, and cortex. So imagine if you are walking in, a, uh, you would like to go for a walk, so you start to walk and you walk on the pavement. So you can still feel the same uh, hardness of the surface below your feet. Yeah, you just uh, make another st one step and the other step and third step and fourth step, it's still the same. But then you go into uh, onto a meadow or into, into a forest and then the surface starts to change. And your cerebellum, which main function is the coordination of movements, has to be informed about changed uh, environment. In this case, it means the quality of the surface we are working on. And the structure which highlights the change, which comes from your receptors, yeah, the touch receptors and proprio receptors, it's olive. So the olive highlights what is different. So it helps you in learning uh, uh, different changes to, uh, uh, to uh, motor stereotypes. So you can have a stereotype to walk. When you start to climb stairs, it's still walking, but you have to raise the lower limb a bit higher. Yeah, And olive helps you in that. So olive helps in learning of uh, different uh, motor patterns than, than usual and informs you about what is new outside. Yeah, so that's the function of the olive approximately. Question to that? Mm 
Okay, and the last structure here is this one. I mean, on the ventral surface. And it's the trigeminal tubercle. And what is below trigeminal tubercle? It's the spinal nucleus and the fibers which comes from and to the spinal nucleus, which are called spinal tract. Yeah. So if you would cut it here, no pain, no sensation from the head is uh, transmitted then farther into the brain. Yeah. So there are three structures on the posterior, on the anterior aspect. It's pyramid with corticospinal voluntary motor tract, olive, which is highlighting uh, changed information coming from spinal cord into the cerebellum, and trigeminal tubercle with spinal uh, nucleus of trigeminal nerve. Yeah, there's another figure for that. You can see this. It's a termination of anterior median fissure of the spinal cord and medulla oblongata, and it's called a foramen cecum. You may know that we have another two foramina cica. One foramen cecum or blind opening is where? Could you, could you give me the answer where we can find foramen cecum or a blind opening? Tongue, perfect, on the dorsum of the tongue, yes. And it's a remnant of the descent of thyroid gland. And the other one? It's in the skull. There used to be a, a vein during development and sometimes the vein can remain there. No idea where is, yeah, perfect. Near cribriform plate, perfect Katarina, in front of the cribriform plate, yeah. So this is the third foramen cecum and the least important, yeah? It is just here. No function. Okay. So when we look from the posterior view, yeah, here you can see part of the cerebellum which has been cut and we can look into the fourth ventricle already. Yeah. This is, which nerve is this one? Do you have any idea? We look from the dorsal aspect. This is thalamus. Yeah. This is third ventricle. Yeah, trochlear nerve, perfect, perfect, Katarina Christoph, yes. This is pineal gland. Yeah, and I take a different color and uh, I will highlight the brain stem. Yeah, this is the mesencephalon. Yeah, in this area. So back here to the fourth ventricle. And when we cut the rest, what you can see here, these structures, these structures lead inside the brain stem. Yeah, they interconnect, uh, sorry, cerebellum. They interconnect brain stem from here up into cerebellum. So we call them peduncles, yeah, peduncles, which means a little, uh, little legs. And these peduncles uh, transmit fibers from brainstem to cerebellum. So we have three pairs of them. Yeah, I can draw it like a cerebellum looks as a UFO, yeah? Three pairs of peduncles and this is when, if we look from the uh, dorsal aspect, yeah? and if you look from lateral aspect, you can see the brain stem, which looks like this, and then the UFO with one pair, and the other pair, and the last pair. Yeah, and the third ventricle is between the, it's it's a tent between the UFO and the floor. You understand that? Yeah? So these are then the, the peduncles. And as I said, we have three pairs, superior, middle, and inferior, yeah? 
the superior goes to mesencephalon, inferior goes to medulla oblongata, and middle goes to pons. Okay, so when we cut all the cerebellum with its peduncles, what we get? We get the floor of fourth ventricle, which is here. And it is not a problem for you because you know it from uh, the nuclei. Uh, can I find the right one? Sorry. <laughs> I'll come to that later, but I think you, you know this. Uh, from all the nuclei, so for example, here is the nucleus of uh, abducent nerve and the facial nerve makes here the loop around, yeah? So this is the fourth of the uh, floor of the fourth ventricle, which is called a rhomboid fossa, according to the rhombic shape. But back to medulla oblongata, yeah? I'll come to this back in, in, uh, again in uh, part of pons. So we can see this. This structure is on the lateral side. So it's the trigeminal tubercle. Yeah, trigeminal tubercle, which is on the lateral side for the spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve. And these two structures are called gracile and cunate tubercle. Yeah, gracile and cunate tubercle. Gracile and cunate tubercle. Why they are called like that? Because they are termination of gracile and cunate fascicle. Yeah? And they are here synapsing within the gracile and cunate nucleus. Yeah? They synapse here, they cross, which is called decusation, and they continue on the other side quite medially. Yeah, and it's called lemniscus. The continuation is called lemniscus. So which tract is that? It's bulbospinothalamocortical tract. So proprioception and fine touch, yeah? It's synapsed here in this nucleus, which is located below gracil and cunei tubercle. Then it's crossed and then it continues as a medial lemniscus, yeah? located medially next to the midline. Yeah, so when I'll come back in here, when the fiber comes like this up, it's synapsed, and from the synapse it's decusated and then it continues up. Yeah, to thalamus. So that's one structure. The other structure is the inferior peduncle. Yeah, so we, he, we have the inferior cerebral peduncle and this peduncle brings uh, information into cerebellum. And the peduncle consists of two parts. One is called restiform and the other is called yuxta restiform. And the word yuxta means next to something, by something, close to something, yeah? And the yuxta restiform part contains only vestibular cerebellar fibers, yeah? When they come from vestibulum, they are concerning balance. And the cerebellum, the function of cerebellum is coordination of the movement and balance, yeah? And uh, next to the cunate nucleus, we have this accessory cunate nucleus. And the accessory cunate nucleus serves, when I'll come back to this figure, serves for another fibers. Oh, sorry. Let the fibers go up. Yeah. They are synapsed. And some of them continue, yeah, like this. That's still the spino bulbo cortical tract for fine touch and proprioception. And some of the fibers synapse and go into cerebellum and 
bring the same information, so fine touch and proprioception, into cerebellum. And there are synapses in so-called nucleus cuneatus accessorius, so accessory cuneate nucleus. Yeah? So we have three nuclei here, the gracile and cuneate, which uh, is a real a relay center for the cerebral cortex, and accessory cuneate nucleus, which is a relay center for cerebellum. Yeah, still bringing the same information. So that's the posterior view. So now we know what is ventrally, dorsally, and lateral. Now let's look what is inside. Inside are nuclei and tracts. Okay, which nuclei? Olivary inferior complex. We have talked about that, that it highlights uh, different information coming into cerebellum. Gracile and cuneate nucleus, yeah, relaying fine uh, touch and proprioception information for cerebral cortex. And accessory cuneate nucleus, relaying the same information for cerebellum. Then nuclei of cranial nerves. Hypoglossal nerve emerging in pre olival groove. Glossopharyngeal vagus accessory emerging in pre olivary groove. Trigeminal nerve and spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve below trigeminal tubercle on the lateral side. So this is known for you. Then we have nuclei of reticular formation, yeah? which are usually called reticular nuclei, easy name. But some of them are called raphael nuclei. Rafe means a suture, yeah? a suture or a su, so it's in the midline. So raphael are unpaired, yeah? that's very important. These are unpaired, so they are in the midline. And what is their function? Their function is to, pro to produce serotonin. Yes, serotonin is a neurotransmitter and it's used down in spinal cord to inhibit pain. Yeah. How it stimulates it? I will explain you later. It's stimulated by the spinoreticular a slow pain tract. Uh, in reticular formation, we will explain this later. But now, if you have the pain, you can inhibit, you can block the pain using serotonin, which then is transmitted down to spinal cord to block it. So Raphael nuclei are nuclei of reticular formation producing serotonin to inhibit the pain stimuli. And then we have arcuate nuclei, and I will talk about them in points then later, yeah, to understand the function. So these are the nuclei. Yeah, what, so what was new today? New term was this one, and uh, this one. Okay, what about tracts? You can see a list of tracts, but if you see the tracts again, you all know them, or majority. Corticospinal is the descending major, that means pyramidal tract. Yeah? Ascending, what is ascending? Spino bulbo, no, sorry, spino bulbo thalamocortical, which is crossed, and before, of course, it's synapsed in the Cunate and gracile nucleus, yeah, and then it continues and crossed, and then it continues as medial lemniscus, yeah, and it takes the fine touch and proprioception. This is the spino bulbo thalamocortica. For the pain, fast pain, we have the spinothalamic, which is, which is crossed at the level of the spinal cord. Here it just goes through and continues up, and in brainstem, it's called spinal lemniscus. So do not mix it with the medial lemniscus, yeah? Spinal lemniscus, which is located lateral 
to medial left meniscus. Slow pain, spin or reticular. It's crossed and uncrossed, half and half. And it terminates in reticular formation. And it brings the information to the Raphael nuclei to release serotonin down to inhibit the pain. Yeah? So that's the spinal reticular tract. And another descending tracts, we have to talk about the corticospinal, which is pyramidal. Then we have the extra pyramidal. And you know, reticulospinal, mainly for gamma neurons. You know, the rubrospinal, mainly for flexors of the girdle muscles. We know the vestibulospinal, mainly for extensors, that means a posture muscles. And we will learn another, tectospinal. Tectospinal comes from mesencephalon, from a part which is called tectum. And what is a tectum? Tectum is the part where you have the fourth, uh, fourth to bear, fourth, uh, colicus for tuberculosis. I'll show you, yeah, I'll go up and it's this one. This is the tectum, yeah. These four tubercles we call tectum, yeah, this area. So tectospinal tract comes from this area. The main function of tectum, especially here, is vision, yeah. So it's a vision, but mainly not vision itself, what you see, but the gaze where you look at, yeah? So tectospinal tract is mainly bringing information into the muscles moving the head and neck. So it helps you in moving head and neck uh, in coordination with uh, visual information. So for example, if you would like to move the head to the side to see something else, like uh, if you are looking at football and you can see how uh, the guy from the left passes uh, the ball to the guy on the right side, you just move the head and you move the head and eyes and neck all together synchronized watching uh, the ball. Yeah, so it helps in synchronization of these movements. And there's another structure which helps that. And that's a very old structure, which is called medial longitudinal fascicle. So you can imagine an owl, yeah, the night bird called owl, which is sitting firmly on a, uh, firmly on a branch of tree, yeah, like that. And then something is happening and she's moving like that. Yeah, and if there's a, some noise, so I make the noise, and she moves like that. And this is an involuntary movement which is mediated by medial longitudinal fascicle. So medial longitudinal fascicle altogether mediates the coordination movements of the eyes, head and neck in coordination with the visual, auditory and balance information. So it moves three kinds of muscles, yeah, eye, head and neck in coordination with three kind of uh, senses, vision, hearing and balance. Yeah, I will come to this uh, repetitively so you will, you will learn it. Yeah, so that's medial longitudinal fascicle, quite old. That means centrally and dorsally located structure. And then we have a posterior longitudinal fascicle. And this brings information from a hypothalamus to parasympathetic cranial nerves nuclei. Yeah, as you know, hypothalamus is the highest autonomic center. 
and it has to bring the information to the autonomic nuclei. And in the brainstem, the cranial nerves has got only parasympathetic nuclei, yeah? So posterior longitudinal fascicle is uh, responsible for that. Okay, and then we can see these two, raphe spinal and cerulo spinal and they are chemical ones. So the raphe spinal, as we know, brings serotonin, yeah, mainly to the spinal cord to inhibit the pain. Cerulo spinal brings noradrenaline, norepinephrine. It goes from a nucleus, which is called nucleus ceruleus, that means blue, blue nucleus in pons, yeah? I'll come to that again in pons. So you can see that there are many tracts, but at least uh, two thirds of them you know, and which are new for you is uh, the medial longitudinal fascicle for coordination of the eye, head and neck movements in coordination with the visual, auditory and balance um, impulses. The posterior longitudinal fascicle uh, connecting hypothalamus and parasympathetic uh, nuclei of the brainstem, and then the raphe spinal and cerebral spinal chemical tracts bringing serotonin and noradrenaline to other structures. Okay, so now let's look at the sections. You should understand majority of the sections. Some of them you are obliged uh, to draw. Which of them you have to draw we will go through them in detail during the practicals, yeah? So now I go mainly through all of them to understand how you should approach them and what you can see. So this is a section between medulla oblongata and spinal cord, so a level of C1 or level of uh, pyramidal decusation. So you will remember that all the time what is ventrally in the spinal cord and brain stem is uh, pyramidal, pyramidal tract or corticospinal tract, yeah, which is here. On the contrary, dorsally, we have some other structures. Dorsally, we have these, which are posterior uh, funiculus, which consists of gracile and cunate funiculus, which is related in gracile and cunate nucleus. So these are the nuclei where it's relayed, yeah? where it's synapsed. So then here you find uh, gracil and here cuneate tubercle. Here you find a pyramid. On the side, there is the trigeminal tubercle. Because here you have the spinal tract and spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve, yes? In the midline, central canal, and here on the side, tracts which goes into cerebellum. So posterior spinocerebellar and anterior spinocerebellar. And I return here, posterior and anterior spinocerebellar tracts. Yeah, the last tracts inside the medulla oblongata. And then next to it, we find the Anterior, anterior and lateral spinothalamic tract. So fast pain, yeah? Fast pain, crude touch, heat and cold. So do you have now any question? It was quite long, but uh, hopefully you have caught some of the information. So this is the way how we will continue farther up and up. So that was now the section uh, here through the level uh, marked C. What we are you looking at? We are looking at the rhomboid fossa. Yeah, rhomboid fossa is the floors of the fourth ventricle. What you can see here on the floors of the fourth ventricle, you can see this, which is median groove, yeah, sulcus medianus, yeah, it's just in the midline, and it's a continuation of this, 
which is the posterior median groove of the spinal cord. This is the gracile tubercle and cuneate tubercle, yeah, cuneate and gracile tubercle. Next to it is a trigeminal tubercle, this you know. Here you can see uh, the sections of the peduncles to the brain, to the cerebellum, yeah? So the UFO legs, superior, middle and inferior cerebellar peduncles. This is what you already know, so-called facial colicles. And what is below facial colicle? Nucleus of abdus and nerve and fibers of facial nerve turning around, yeah, forming so-called genu. This area developmentally corresponds to basal plate. This area, that means basal plate, motor. This area corresponds to alar plate, sensory, yeah. We call this area medial eminence. The lateral area is innominate. And in between is a groove. And the groove is called limitating groove, sulcus limitans. And if you hear limitans, it means that it comes from embryology. Okay, number nine is the most lateral area. And the most lateral area means that below are nuclei of the special sensory nerve, which is vestibular cochlear. And as you know, we have two cochlear and four vestibular. So the vestibular nuclei are larger. That's why the area is called only vestibular area. On the contrary, the most medial area belongs to the somatomotor somite nerve, which is hypoglossal nerve, yes. That's why this triangle of the hypoglossal nerve is medially. Triangle of the branchiomotor, yeah, branchial somatomotor nerve, that is the nucleus ambiguous of vagus nerve is located more laterally. And a structure which is New, what is this? Locus ceruleus, a blue nucleus and a blue spot. It's blue because there are uh, more vessels just below the surface, so you can see the color of, of the blood. Yeah. And as I said, locus ceruleus produces noradrenaline. The Raphael nuclei will be somewhere here in the midline. Yeah. So this will be the Raphael nuclei producing serotonin. I return here to show you. Yeah. Locus ceruleus produce noradrenaline. Raphael produce serotonin. Yeah. So they are located here in these areas. So that's the morphology of the rhomboid fossa. And we continue in the sections. This is a similar section uh, which we had before uh, here. Yeah, it's it's similar. Uh, sorry, in here, and uh, I'll just will repeat the, the main uh, structure so you can you can understand them well. Yeah. So ventrally we have the corticospinal tract. Dorsally we have the uh, Spinobulbotalamocortical tract, which is synapsed in gracile and cuneate tubercle. Then it's decussated and it continues uh, as a medial lemniscus here yeah, for fine touch and proprioception. Here ventrally we have the spinothalamic tract and the number 12 is a bit smaller rubrospinal descending tract. These which are really on the side, they are spinocerebellar tracts, yeah, bringing the information into the cerebellum. 
and of course here has to be uh, the spinal nucleus of trigeminal nerve and nuclei are located uh, more to the center yeah so the nucleus of uh, the vagus nerve and nucleus of the abducens nerve um, sorry of oh, the hypoglossal nerve of course hypoglossal the number 12. So when we, uh, and this is the same, yeah, this is the same. So again, uh, cunate and gracile tubercle with the decusation, uh, hypoglossal and the vagus nuclei, trigeminal nerve, spinothalamic and spinocerebellar. Yeah, you just need to go through that uh, repetitively and you will understand it. When we move a bit up, that means when we move here, yeah, so the section goes already through the inferior part of the fourth ventricle. You can see the fourth ventricle. You can see nicely the eminence, the medial eminence, yeah, the limitating groove. Below medial eminence is the nucleus of uh, hypoglossal nerve because it's the somite somatomotor. The other nuclei of the vagus nerve, which is branchial somatomotor and its visceromotor nucleus and its viscerosensory nucleus, that means nucleus of solitary tract, they are located more laterally. And the most lateral below the area vestibularis is the vestibular nucleus, yeah? And the fibers goes like this. Of course, on the side is trigeminal nerve, it's spinal nucleus. And on the very lateral side, the spinal uh, cerebellar tracts. This is pyramid and this is olive, yeah? Inferior olivary complex, I told you, looks as a folded sac. So you can see the folded sac here, and you can see how the trigeminal, uh, sorry, how the hypoglossal nerves gets in the pre olivary groove and how the vagus nerve gets out in the retro olivary groove. Medially, we find the old structures, yeah, longitudinal medial fascicle. Yeah, medial longitudinal fascicle, which is for coordination of the eye, head, and neck movements together with the, or, or on the reaction uh, of the visual, auditory, and balance impulses. And what is this? This is a new structure appearing here. And it's the medial lemniscus. Yeah, where is it here? Medial lemniscus. So when I come back, you can see here that the spinobulbotalamocortical tract is synapsed, crossed, and when it's crossed, it remains here, medially and dorsally to pyramidal tract. So it's medially and dorsally to pyramidal tract. And now it will travel farther as a medial lemniscus. Yeah. And a similar, a similar figure here. So again, this is the pyramidal tract. Here you can see the olive, yeah. This is already uh, the inferior peduncle which goes into the cerebellum. Yeah, it's on the other side here. Inferior cerebellar peduncle, yeah. Above pyramid is the medial lemniscus. So it's already decusated tract for fine touch and proprioception. These are the old tracts. Yeah, the medial longitudinal fascicle and tectospinal tract, which serves for the coordination of the head, neck, and eye movements. And then we can see the nerves. Yeah, this is the 12th in front of the olive and the 10th behind the olive. And this area is the area of reticular formation. So you would pose a question, why should I know uh, this in such a detail? Yeah. This, if we move uh, more a bit farther, and this is the reason why you should know it. 
So we have some brain arteries. And they can suffer from atherosclerosis or embolism. So there can be an ischemia or a bleeding, which will destroy a, a specific and defined part of the brain here of the brainstem. So you can see if you have a problem in the branch of the vertebral artery, which is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So which structures are impaired? Inferior cerebral peduncle. So the connection to cerebellum. Yes. Vestibular nuclei. So problems with balance. Yeah. Then the fibers of the vagus nerve. So the palsy of the vagus nerve. Yeah. Uh, spinal nucleus and trigeminal, uh, spinal nucleus and spinal tract of trigeminal nerve. So the problems with the sensation from the head and pain from the head. Yeah. So these are the, the major structures which are here and partially also the part of the reticular formation. So how the patient would look like? Here you have all the symptoms. So we go through the symptoms. Yeah. So vestibular nuclei. If you uh, affect vestibular nuclei or vestibular nerve, we already know all these symptoms. Yeah. Vertigo, nausea, vomiting, and the uh, uncoordinated movements of uh, the eyeballs, which is called nystagm. So you will have these. Then we have to talk about uh, the inferior cerebellar peduncles, yeah, which connects medulla oblongata to cerebellum. So there will be ipsilateral lesion of cerebellum and all the cerebral functions will be impaired. We will talk about the cerebral functions later in special lecture. Then the problems with uh, uh, spinal nucleus and tract of trigeminal nerve. And as I said, no sensation, so that's anesthesia, and no, sen and, uh, no uh, feeling of the pain and temperature. So analgesia, no pain, and thermoanesthesia, no uh, sensation of cold and heat of the head on the same side. If we come back, we have here also the uh, lateral spinothalamic tract, yeah, which is here, so it's in here. So spinothalamic tract, it conveys the fast pain crew touch from the body. So we will have the same. So loss of pain sensation, loss of cold and heat sensation from the body, but contralateral because it's, as I showed, it's a crossed, yeah? This one is not crossed, it's ipsilateral. So we have to distinguish that. We have problems with the vagus nerve, yeah? This is the vagus nerve nucleus. So the problems with uh, swallowing, the problem with speech on the same side that it is not crossed. Yeah. And I said we will have problems with the reticular formation in here. And the reticular formation brings sympathetic fibers, yeah, descending sympathetic fibers to level of C8. And from level of C8 then, up to the eye. And you remember we have talked about the Claude Bernard Hornet syndrome. Do you, know, do you please remember the symptoms of Claude Bernard Hornet syndrome? Can you write me four symptoms? There are five, but four is enough. Ptosis is perfect. Ptosis is due to the problems with uh, superior tarsal muscle. Yes. Meiosis, yeah, due to problems with uh, uh, dilator pupillae muscle. Yeah. 
Then problems with the orbitalis muscle in the inferior orbital fissure, the small muscle in the fissure. When the eyeball is retracted, how we call it, retracted eyeball. And the fourth one is dry skin on the head. So no sweating. And ophthalmos, yes, perfect. And ophthalmos is the restricted eyeball. And the problems with sweating. You remember the name? Perfect, Christoph anhedrosis. So now we know it. And that's the last uh, symptom here. So you can see it's quite complicated, more symptoms, but if you know the anatomy good, well, if you know it well, you can derive all these. So if you see patient with all these, you can definitely say the problem is in this area and you can indicate just from your outpatient uh, ambulance, you would just indicate a specific angiography of the vertebral basilar system and you have the diagnosis, yeah? And you can help the patient to treat it more quickly. So the so-called Wallenberg lateral medullar syndrome, yeah? As it, as we come, as we find it in the lateral part of the medulla oblongata. So when we have a lateral, we have first, of course, a medial one, which is a problem of the vertebral artery. So the vertebral artery is running here, yeah? And if the vertebral artery is blocked in this area, only one and only in this area, and there's a, uh, of course, retrograde, uh, uh, retrograde uh, flow into its other branches, it affects only these. So we will have problem with the corticospinal tract, we will have problem with the medial lemniscus, and we will have problems with the glossopharyngeal nerve. So try to give me the answer how this Dejaren medial medullar syndrome looks like. Yeah? And you have to tell me also the site. So try to give me the answer how the patient looks like. Three symptoms. So I'm waiting, contralaterally known fine touch. And no proprioception, perfect, Katarina. Yes, that's one of the symptoms. So we call it anesthesia contralateralis, yeah. And another, func uh, and another symptom which we have. Ataxia. Ataxia is uh, is usually used for uh, problems with walking, standing and walking. So it's related to cerebellum and to uh, basal ganglia disorders. Yeah, plagia is a better a better term for what you mean. Yeah, and it's of course contralateral, uh, contralateral hemiplegia. Yeah, contralateral hemiplegia. And the tongue, for the tongue, it's hemiglossoplegia. So as you said, it's contralateral plegia or paresis, it's contralateral uh, anesthesia and problem with proprioception, and it's ipsilateral hemiglossoplegia, yeah, because as you can see here, the hypoglossal nerve is not crossed. So do you understand these two syndromes, please? There are of course more syndromes. I will just show you here one. And that's the syndrome here, yeah. If, if the syndrome will be bigger, if it will be like that, that's the medial uh, vestibular, uh, medial, uh, medullar desgerin, which we have talked about. And this number one, hemiplegia alternance, yeah, uh, 
what this means. It means we have problems in hypoglossal nerve, yeah, and pyramidal tract. So the patient has got the hemiplegia contralateral and the hemiglossoplegia ipsilateral. So you have one of the plegia is is hemi hemiplegia is contralateral and the hemiglossoplegia so the tongue is ipsilateral yeah so you can see that the tongue is uh, affected on the other side than the body than the limbs that's why we call it alternating hemiplegia and we have three of them the inferior is in medulla oblongata middle is in pons and superior is in mesencephalon and if you see this, you definitely know where is the problem. Yeah, and the problem is in pyramidal tract and the nerve which leaves just close to the pyramidal tract. The other syndromes are just here to show you how it's complex and when you will be neurologist, you can then uh, differentiate the different syndromes. Yeah. Okay. Questions? If there are no questions, uh, we can have break uh, to 14.45 and then we continue with the uh, uh, bonds. Yes? So we, now we are moving to pons. <laughs> pons is the middle part of the brainstem, which is bulging ventrally. Yeah, and the dorsally, it forms the floor of the fourth ventricle, so the upper part of the rhomboid fossa. If you look here, you can see it. This is so-called bulbopontine groove. Yeah, bulbopontine groove. And in this groove, the sixth cranial nerve emerges. Then here in this corner, and this corner is called pontocerebellar angle, pontocerebellar angle, and that's the exit of the facial and vestibulocochlear nerve. So that's pontocerebellar angle. On the other side, this groove has no name. This is already mesencephalon, yeah, this part above. So you can see here the third and fourth cranial nerve. And this is the fifth. So the fifth nerve is another nerve which emerges uh, from the pons. And in between is an arbitrary line which we call trigemino facial line. And it's border between pons and cerebellum. Yeah, an arbitrary border. And in the midline, we have so called basilary groove for basilary artery. Uh, this uh, trigeminofacial line shows us on the transaction, the connection between pons and cerebellum, which is called the middle cerebellar peduncles. Why is the pons so bulging ventrally? The reason is very easy. This is corticospinal tract, yeah, decusated here. And majority of the pyramidal tract is formed by corticopontine fibers. The fibers are synapsed here, and then they, they are crossed and they continue to the cerebellum. They are called corticopontine fibers and they form majority of the fibers. Yeah, that's why the pons is so big because there are so many nuclei, which we call easily pontine nuclei, and it goes into cerebellum. Why? The function of cerebellum is coordination of the movements. So if you would like to coordinate the movement, you have to send the information first from, uh, from the cortex to pons and cerebellum, then back to cortex and then down to the effector muscles, yeah? 
So that's the external features which we have here. And we have talked about all of them. So now the internal ones. Internally, we can divide it into two parts. The ventral, which is called also basilar part, and it contains only pyramidal tract. So the corticospinal and corticopontine fibers and the pontine nuclei where the corticopontine fibers where they synapse. Yeah? And then the rest, the posterior part, and it's called tegmentum. Yeah, tegmentum means something like a roof or the scaffold carrying the roof. Yeah, so tegmentum is the dorsal part. And what does it contain? It contains all ascending tracts, which is a lemniscus, the medial and the spinal lemniscus. The old tracts, the medial longitudinal fascicle for the coordination of the eye, head and neck movements in coordination with the visual, auditory and balance impulses. And the posterior longitudinal fascicle, which connects hypothalamus and parasympathetic nuclei of cranial nerves. That's why it contains also nuclei of cranial nerves and reticular formation. Yeah. So there's the internal division into two parts. Now let's talk about the nuclei and the tracts. So which nuclei we have? Okay, the nuclei which you know are the nuclei of cranial nerves. Facial and vestibulocochlear, they appear in the pontocerebellar angle. Abducens appears in the bulbopontine groove and the trigeminal nerves it leaves uh, in the trigeminofacial line from the aerostral part of pons. So that's easy. Then we have the pontine nuclei. What are the pontine nuclei? I told you the corticopontine tract, yeah, which is the part of pyramidal tract, synapsed, crossed, and to cerebellum. Yeah? So these nuclei are the connections from the cortex to cerebellum. Then we have another group of nuclei. We have talked about the inferior olivary complex in medulla oblongata. Now we talk about the superior olivary nucleus. This nucleus, together with the nucleus of trapezoid body, nucleus of trapezoid body are two nuclei which are part of the auditory pathway, yeah, of the auditory tract. But their function is not in perceiving the sound, but it's in uh, finding the source of the sound, to locate uh, the uh, sound source in the environment, if it comes from the left or from the right side. Yeah? We'll talk about this in detail in tracts, uh, which will be the, the final lecture of the brain. But now you should remember that the superior olivary nucleus and the nucleus of trapezoid body are the nuclei which has a role in a location of the sound source. Yeah. And then we have a nuclei which are called parabrachial. Why are they are called parabrachial? Brachium is an old term for uh, middle cerebellar peduncles. Yeah? The pontine brachia are the old term for the middle cerebellar peduncles. So the parabrachial nuclei are next to the middle cerebellar peduncles and they have very complex function. Yeah? They have very complex function. They also produce serotonin like the Raphael ones. They are involved in uh, pain, in the affective emotional uh, component of pain. They work as a pneumotactic respiration center. They work for uh, affective uh, 
component of taste or uh, sorry adverative component of taste so they have a very very complex function and we will return to them repetitively so now you will know that parabrachial nuclei are a complex functional nuclei in the pons and we will come to that in every of these functions during the study of cms so questions to this everything seems either so exhausting or so clear that we can continue and this is now very easy to understand it's just a, a superposition of the nuclei of cranial nerves on the floor of the fourth ventricle on the rhomboid fossa yeah so now it is obligatory to know it okay solitary tract nuclei which are these we can find them here yeah solitary tract nuclei they are mainly uh, nuclei for the vagus nerve and they are viscerosensory yeah they are viscerosensory so they come all the afferent information from the organs of the uh, root of the tongue pharynx larynx and then foregut and midgut yeah so when they receive all this viscerosensory information they use it for the visceromotor nucleus as well which mediates uh, reflexes so which reflexes different reflexes like vomiting and swallowing reflex yeah for the upper GIT coughing reflex and breathing reflex for respiratory tract orgasm reflex yeah, for your genital one uh, salivation reflex for the glands uh, of the head like parotid submandibular sublingual secretion of the gastric and pancreatic fluid yeah so it helps to mediate all these so uh, here we have another important structure and it's a chemo receptor yeah we find it in this area and we call it area postrema yeah area like area and postremus means the most posterior area postrema and it's a chemoreceptor and this chemoreceptor gives you information about ph about the concentration of uh, of hydrogen uh, uh, protons of the protons of uh, hydrogen ions in the blood in the plasma and then in the cerebrospinal fluid and based on it you know what is the pH and if the pH is very very low then you can start to vomit for example yeah so area postrema gives and it's a central chemoreceptor giving the information about the pH and uh, also about the carbon dioxide concentration which is pH dependent yeah in such a nucleus, of course, we have in a spinal cord with a similar function, and it's the intermediomedial, which is a viscerosensory autonomic nucleus as well. For the spinal nerves, nuclei of solitary tract are viscerosensory for uh, lateral mixed system that is glossopharyngeal, but mainly vagus and axis. So quite complicated nuclei. And that's why we just finished the nuclei here yeah we can continue with the tracts so in the basilar in the ventral part we have the corticospinal and corticopontine tracts yeah and they travel this way corticospinal like this and corticopontine like this and they are uh, synapsed so we call them longitudinal fibers when they when the corticopontine relay yeah or synapse here they continue as the transverse pontocerebellar fibers through the medial pedunculus through the middle cerebellar peduncle into cerebellum so the term longitudinal transverse pontine fibers are quite clear now yeah longitudinal are these transverse are these 
So these are fibers in the basilar part and in the posterior or tegmental part, which tracks we find. And again, all the tracks you know. So for the pain, we have the spinothalamic, which is crossed at the spinal level. Yeah. And it continues up as the spinal lemniscus. Spinobulbotalamocortical, which is crossed at the level of the medulla oblongata, then continues as the medial lemniscus. Yeah? And it takes the fine touch and proprioception. And both then converge in thalamus, in the so called VPL, ventral posterolateral nucleus, and continues to area three, one, and two. Yeah, so the fibers, they run in different tracts, but they continue and terminate in the same area of the cortex. We have the spinocerebellar anterior tract, which then goes to mesencephalon, and in mesencephalon it goes into cerebellum, yeah, through the superior cerebellar peduncle. Spinoreticular continues into reticular formation and it takes the slow pain into reticular formation. And this old fascicles we know, yeah, medial for the coordination of the head, neck, and eye movements, and posterior for connection of the autonomic system, hypothalamus, and parasympathetic nuclei of cranial nerves. Descending are the extra pyramidal. Yeah, reticulospinal for gamma motor neurons, rubrospinal for flexors of the girdle muscles. Vestibulospinal is not here anymore, yeah, as the vestibular nuclei are located in the medulla oblongata, so it is not here anymore. But we here have the tectospinal, which brings the information uh, for the coordination of the eye and the head movements yeah and then we have the cerulospinal which brings down from locus cerulus nor adrenaline then we have this interstitial spinal i will talk about this later in mesencephalon so if you see it majority of the tracts are again the same and should make no problem so what to know about the fourth ventricle? So the fourth ventricle, if you look from dorsal, it looks like that, yeah? So the floor makes the rhomboid fossa. So the floor is, is this. But if you look from the side, it looks as a tent, yeah? And the tent roof is formed by different structures. So the superior part is called superior medullary velum. Velo means a sail, yeah, from a ship. So a sail, velum. And of course, we have the inferior medullar velum as well here. The top here is called fastigium. Fastigium is the top of a house with such a roof, yeah. So then fastigium is uh, this part. That's why this is called fastigium. And we will need this term in a cerebellum then because there are some nuclei. Okay, obex is the caudal end. Obex means a dam. A dam of when you have a, a big water area and there's a dam blocking the water to continue. So this is obex here. Yeah. And then we have two openings. Oh better say three openings. One opening is this. Yeah, it goes dorsally and it's the median aperture or foramen of Majan D. Yeah. And on the side, so on the side it means somewhere here on the side, here on the side. And this one will be somewhere here superposed, superimposed like that. We have lateral aperture, which is of course paired and it's called foramen of Lushka. So you have three 
openings which allow the cerebrospinal fluid to get out from the fourth ventricle into subarachnoidal space. Yes, and then this continuation up is the sylvian duct. The continuation down is central canal of spinal cord. So then the fourth ventricle is not so complicated. And the last information is that inside is a choroid plexus. Choroid plexus looks like a set of cauliflowers which produces, uh, uh, please give me a second here. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, I just talked to Martin. Uh, we are going to continue uh, about the choroid plexus. Yeah, choroid plexus is uh, like a, a, a plate of cauliflower extensions of the pia mater which produces the cerebrospinal fluid yeah and we find it in every ventricle in the lateral ventricles third and the fourth yeah so we can see uh, the choroid plexus here and it's suspended from such a plate which is called tela choroid tela yeah is like a, like a pillow, flat pillow. And part of the choroid plexus even extend out, extend out here. And it's called, uh, it's called a Bohdalek uh, flower basket, Bohdalek flower basket. Yeah, but it is not clinically so important. Okay, so that's the fourth ventricle and the floor of the fourth ventricle. And here we can see the fourth ventricle, how it looks like. So this is the lateral, lateral uh, RSS with the Lushka's opening. Yeah. And here dorsally is the median Anpert Majandi opening. And the top, which is called fastigium. So that's the shape of the fourth, uh, of the fourth ventricle, which looks as, as a tent. So now we should talk about uh, sections, yeah? Sections are the uh, pre-last uh, information about the pons. So what we can see on this section? This section is made here at the level of the super, uh, of the facial collicle. So we can see the facial collicle here. And what is below facial collicle? Below facial collicle, of course, we can find uh, Nucleus of abducent nerve and fibers of facial nerve. Yeah? So this is also the facial collicle is at the level of medial eminence. And yeah? the medial eminence is, is, as I said, this area of the basal plate. So medial eminence. And then this area is the uh, vestibular area. Yeah, the vestibular area is here. So you can see that the vestibular and cochlear nuclei are located below the vestibular area. Uh, then, of course, through the whole brainstem, we find the nucle nucleus and tract of trigeminal nerve. In this case, is uh, the principal nucleus of trigeminal nerve. Ventrally is the pyramidal tract, yeah? and the corticospinal and corticopontine. Yeah, corticopontine then goes to the lateral as the transverse fibers, yeah, transverse fibers and uh, the corticospinal continues as the longitudinal fibers. Okay, in the midline we find a medial lemniscus. Yeah, medial lemniscus is the fine touch and proprioception. In the midline dorsally, we find the old structures, medial longitudinal fascicle and tectospinal tract, which serve for the coordination of the head and neck and eye movement. Yeah? And then this structure here is so-called trapezoid body. So the trapezoid body and superior olivary nucleus, which will be here, are, they, they function as uh, the centers 
for a localization of the sound source. Yeah, if it's from the left side, the right side, ventral or dorsal. So there's the section here. Any question? Yeah, we can see uh, the similar section on, on a different figure. Yeah, where you nicely see uh, the basilar part with the corticospinal and cortico uh, nuclear and cortico pontine fibers and the pontine nuclei. The pontine nuclei in medulla oblongata, they extend even into the medulla oblongata, they are called arcuate nuclei. Yeah, we have mentioned the term. So if the nuclei for corticopontine and pontocerebral tract are located more distally, more caudally within medulla oblongata, they are called arcuate fibers because of arcuate nuclei, arcuate nuclei according to their shape. Yeah. Uh, we can see the trapezoid body in the midline and medial lemniscus here located and facial colicle with the abducent nerve and facial nerve turning around. Okay, yeah. here we see uh, we are a bit, uh, a bit uh, more rostrally and we can see nicely the uh, trapezoid body, yeah. Trapezoid body is in the midline as the uh, auditory pathway, yeah, it decusates and then continues up, yeah, and it continues up after this decusation. So the trapezoid body is also a decusation of decusation of the auditory tract. So these are the sections, and now the last information that there exist also some uh, clinical uh, units. One of them is so-called locked-in syndrome. What is locked-in syndrome? It's a lesion of uh, basilary artery. So when I'll come back here, basilary artery is here, and when the lesion appears, then all this is away. So what happens? There is Quadruparesis, yeah, quadruparesis, quadruplegia, and a plegia of all the cranial nerves in pons and medulla oblongata. So the patient is able only to move the eyes using number three and number four, not six, yeah. So he's only able to moving the eyes. He's able to see, but not to hear, yeah, not to hear because you can see that the auditory tract is here. So the patient can only see and can only move the eyes, but he's awake, yeah? he's not sleeping. So the patient is locked inside his body. We have to distinguish lock in from lock out syndrome. Yeah? Lock out syndrome is when the problem is higher, when the problem is higher than brain stem, yeah, usually in thalamus. Then the patient gets really no information in, yeah, that means also no sensory impulses, no vision, yeah, not only no touch and hearing, but also no vision. Uh, the patient is not awake, yeah, he has got a cycle of sleeping and wakefulness, but he is not awake, he is not communicating. Yeah. Why he can breathe without the help of respiratory devices? Give me the answer. Why he is able to breathe? So the patient is just lying and you have to clean his respiratory, his airways several times per day. You have to feed him by, uh, by gastrostomy or uh, using uh, using the intravenous approach. Yes, brainstem is not damaged. That means reticular formation with the respiratory centers is working and the phrenic nucleus in spinal cord is working and diaphragma is working. Yeah, the damage is too high in thalamus. 
perfect. And we call it apalic syndrome or permanent vegetative state. So please distinguish these two, these two syndromes. Yeah. Okay. A part of uh, the pontine uh, problems is, of course, a uh, policy of the facial nerve. Yeah, because the facial nerve can be involved uh, in in the damage. So please, again, don't forget the difference between peripheral and central. And in the in a central, you have only problems with uh, with the mouth. But in peripheral, you have problems with the mouth and with the eye, yeah? But I think you know this. Of course, we can have problems with the abducer nerve. And for the abducer nerve, you know that it's a convergent strabism, convergent squint. And of course, the syndromes can be more complicated. And I would like to talk about the first one, which is also called the hemiplegia alternans media so the middle alternating hemiplegia and we said that the alternating hemiplegia means problems with pyramidal tract so there will be a contralateral hemiplegia and ipsilateral problem with the cranial nerve the inferior involved hypoglossal nerve the middle one involves facial nerve yeah so it will be a peripheral facial paralysis combined with ipsilateral peripheral facial paralysis combined with contralateral hemiplegia okay that's it so pons was a bit quicker than uh, medulla because many of the structures which are in medulla are also in pons. So now you can give me a question. So I can return to anything what you would like to explain. Uh, I would recommend you really to read again the tracts so you understand the tracts well. If you have done it, then you can read about the nuclei and uh, the external features and then you should read it in another book as a whole, then it will help. So after you pass the original test tomorrow, you can skip Easter reading about the central nervous system, as we could not uh, enjoy any of the Easter uh, habits.